Next, we have two people who spend their days focused intensely on all these issues. Tiffany Moore is Senior Vice President of Political and Industry Affairs for the Consumer Technology Association. Hi, Tiffany. Nuala O'Connor is President of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Hello, hello. And here to lead the conversation, my colleague, the Atlantic's Alexis. Hey, Alexis. Hey, Margaret. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, 50 years ago, the environmental movement uh, coalesced to challenge some of the pros and cons of the industrial economy. Uh, American manufacturing had created this very affluent society, but there were some trade-offs to that. Um, there were places uh, in America on the rural uh, fringes that were being bulldozed. Inside cities, there were major air and water quality problems. And people, I think, oftentimes can caricature what happened with the environmental movement as being just about sort of going green. But really, there was important and bipartisan legislation that was passed during the 1960s and 1970s that reshaped the way that the economy worked uh, and, and really cleaned up the air and water of America, signed into, into law by Richard Nixon. Um, right now, I think we're kind of undergoing a similar moment um, in the digital economy, where we're rethinking the kind of pros and cons of what we built with the internet. Um, so how do we balance uh, this sort of growth engine that's in Silicon Valley with protecting people's privacy? Uh, how should companies engage with authoritarian governments that would like to use their software? And how do we sort of identify and remedy the externalities that come from the attention market? These are all things that are really actively under debate. And most of the time, we've been thinking about these things as kind of cultural or social things. People talk about being addicted to their phones. They talk about uh, that we as a society have lost the art of conversation. Um, but I want to think about that other part of the environmental movement, which was also about legislation and policy and actually changing the way uh, the rules of the, the game worked. So I'm also old enough to remember just a few years ago, three or four years ago, when everyone said, Silicon Valley ignores the hill. And now, of course, technology companies are some of the biggest spenders uh, here in DC. So what changed? Well, I mean, I think it, a lot of it was the maturation of companies. And kind of as they developed uh, kind of their, uh, their businesses, they understood that they needed to have an eye toward Washington. And so you'll find that there are lots, uh, you know, the number of the tech companies have a presence here. And to an earlier point, uh, it's an understanding that it's a partnership as you kind of develop, as you develop products. It's important to kind of understand what the rules of the road are and to make sure that Washington understands kind of, you know, what this innovation could do and how it has, can provide a positive benefit. That's one of the reasons why we try our very best to bring policymakers to CES every year so they can understand how technology has the power to produce incredible innovation and improve lives so that they understand that, you know, while we do in some instances need to have um, uh, a, a, some type of policy, that we can't make, we have to make sure we're not inhibiting innovation that will definitely improve lives. Yeah. Well, you're right to focus on Washington, but I think we in Washington tend to think that's only where the action happens. I love your analogy about the environmental movement. I've been saying since I was at General Electric and at Amazon that like General Electric had to clean up the Hudson River 50 years after its predecessors had polluted it. So the tech industries need to think about their environmental impact and their environmental impact is data, is your data, your data yourself. Um, but I think the most important things happening in data and privacy in this year all happened outside of Washington. Cambridge Analytica, the GDPR in Europe, and the California privacy law are creating a perfect storm of impetus to make things really happen. We've been predicting a privacy law and we've been advocating for privacy law at the Center for Democracy and Technology for almost 25 years, since the dawn of the commercial internet. I think it's really gonna happen. Huh. So you don't think that uh, President Trump being elected had anything to do with the increased scrutiny on the technology industry? When I first came to Washington, I was in a different industry, and I remember uh, Google had a one-person office. This was then a long time ago. But I do think it's kind of, you know, you're focused on innovating. You're focused on building your product. I don't think, you know, to kind of connect it with Trump is, is, you know, President Trump, it's kind of an easy way to suggest, like, tech versus Trump. But I think if you look at how companies were building kind of their Washington presence, and also in state capitals, uh, it was kind of a natural 
huh. increase. I don't think it was something that was rapid. It wasn't like before 2016 and after 2016 a, ma a major shift. Exactly. Well, there's been a long line of administrations advocating some form of regulation or privacy awareness and data control. I mean, really, it dates back to the Clinton administration, the first chief privacy officer, Peter Swire, the Bush administration, I was there, the Obama administration's privacy bill of rights, which is surprisingly similar, actually, to the Trump administration's announcement last week. So there's been a, a steady grow and call, a drumbeat of action on this. Whether it's personality driven, I'm surprised actually at how many big things in life are personality driven, but I am happy with the outcome if we get rules of the road for all companies to deal with individual data responsibly and respectfully for individual consumers. And I do think it's created a conversation around uh, data driven uh, innovation and the importance of data. Now, you do have GDPR and, and kind of California's privacy law, and I think those provide some. Uh, it forces a conversation, particularly in Washington, about how data is used. And it may not, we're not GDPR, we're not Europe, we may, may not be California, but it's forcing a conversation here in Washington about what can we do. And so in that instance, I think it's a good conversation to have. And you see Republicans and Democrats talking about the importance of some type of kind of privacy, you know, privacy legislation. Now, the important thing is about how do you get it right and how do you have a, you know, a rational conversation about how data is used, privacy and security security and making sure we're not using privacy and security interchangeably. What do you make of the hearings with the technology company CEOs? It's a great day when every CEO says, yes, I will endorse some form of legislation or regulation of data as one of the fundamental drivers, as you point out, of the, the information economy. So I think you're right. The, the, the devil is in the details of how that looks. And yes, we are not Europe, and we will not end up with a European style law. But the fundamental principles or values, I think, are actually surprisingly similar. And I do think while the, the, you know, the hearings were illustrative on the CEO part and also on the uh, part of, of policymakers and kind of their understanding of technology, but I think the important work happens not at those hearings, it's, you know, the real work is about, not, I wouldn't say behind closed doors because it's all about, you know, transparency, but again, quiet conversations about, you know, being very open about asking questions about how data is used how you know, data-driven innovation kind of improves lives. And you, even if you look at kind of GDPR, I was actually in Europe uh, when, you know, when it went into effect, and I noticed that you know, there were websites I couldn't access. And if you think about it, particularly from a small business angle, now, a lot of the websites, the big companies were able, you know, big media companies were able to manage that transition, but for some of the smaller newspapers or smaller websites, they couldn't, and so they were basically kind of off the internet if, you're, if you were in Europe. And so I think we need to be careful about a one-size-fits-all approach, and I think what we're experiencing uh, in Europe, and then what the potential we have to experience with California. Which I feel like is a, a term used here like 10 times more than everywhere else. Um, are there like specific pieces of, you know, the, the regulations that we're currently working under that, that you would get rid of, that you feel like have, have been a regulatory overreach? Well, the missing link here, or the difference between our U.S. regulatory framework and basically every other economy in the world that has data is that we have a sectoral approach, right? So we've got health and kids and sex and finance, but we've got huge gaps. And the point I always point, and I shouldn't criticize the wonderful people at Fitbit because we've actually done some great research on their data usage, but Fitbit is a perfect example of a gap. It is some of the most highly sensitive information about my daily life, about my habits, and even my location. It is unregulated. It is ungoverned in the United States right now, and it is in a, in a major gap between a health law and a finance law and a marketing law. And so what we would call for is, at the very least, an umbrella that allows certainty for the individual to know that their data is going to be dealt with with respect, that they will have access and transparency into the activities, but even more, that the individual has control and the ability to continue to have a relationship, that the data doesn't go far afield from them and the, the contract or the relationship they have with the company. That was, I think, to me, the fundamental disclosure of the Cambridge Analytica scenario that not only sensitive data, actually, but trivial data, data like 
what's your favorite color, or what kind of dog breed do you have at home, or my personal favorite, which I was actually doing on Facebook the day that the Cambridge Analytica uh, a debacle was announced, was what's your lucky leprechaun name, right? Because it was St. <laughs> Patrick's Day, and that was a hoot. I can't actually remember. I'm going to have to go back and look at what it was. But trivial data, so inconsequential, humorous entertainment data is being not only transferred from the company that you have a relationship with to another entity far, far afield, and in this case, far, far away geographically for very significant purposes, not only advertising and what you see, but actually to funnel the content of what you understand about the world, and in our case, and frankly in the UK, what kind of political decisions you're making. So trivial data turning into amalgamated data or aggregated data to very consequential impacts on the content of your daily life, that's important. And I think that was an aha moment, a wake-up moment for the United States, just like the Snowden revelations were a wake-up moment on another set of data sharing. And I think people are concerned, and rightly so. Uh -huh. Tiffany, how do you think the device manufacturers that you work with uh, would think about structuring a, a law like this that would help provide a, a framework for, to fill in those gaps, as Nula described it? Internet platforms and uh, kind of device manufacturers, I think the important thing is that it can't be necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach. The type of data that you use on your Fitbit is very different than the data that's used on, you know, an app, a flashlight app, or a calculator app. So I think, you know, the understanding that has to have some flexibility, and I do think that industry can play a role. One of the things we did at CTA is our health and fitness uh, technology division, we created uh, kind of industry agreed upon privacy principles about how data is used, how you communicate that data uh, to consumers and making sure that they understand how it's used. And that was industry, an uh, industry driven approach as opposed to a top down government approach. And so I think the important thing is that industry is part of those conversations and what the NTIA is doing right now kind of uh, focused on privacy. It's kind of industry engaged opportunity to talk about what some kind of guide, you know, guidelines or at least guidance would be. Uh, but I do think we need to make sure that while the emphasis is on the larger companies, the smaller companies that would possibly be hit, particularly if you look at California law, kind of the definition of small business, uh, you know, whether that, that threshold and how that includes startups. Again, the larger companies have the op they have chief privacy officers, they have legal departments, they have incredible teams that can help navigate that world. But if you're looking at startups and you're looking at how do you get to the next Facebook, the next Twitter, or kind of the next you know, big internet platform, would that be possible uh, in a world where, you know, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, permissional innovation that may not necessarily be, you know, a buzzword now, but it did uh, create an opportunity for us to have a benefit of free services, email services. So we need to make sure that we're not inhibiting that type of growth and innovation in the future. Is it possible we should inhibit that kind of growth and innovation in the future? Well, when you use your environmental analogy, you, you think back and say, oh, so it's okay for a small company to pollute the environment, but not for a large company. So I think this is actually setting rules of the road that are, I mean, I take your point about the, the cost of uh, burden of regulation, but if they are baseline rules that everybody has to play by, large, small, no, sector specific uh, exceptions, if they set a, a level playing field that provides certainty, not only for the individual citizen, consumer, customer, but also for the companies that these are the things we value. These are important to respect dignity in the digital world, and we think that the cost of, of data breaches, but also of the misuse of data, of the excessive use of data is so great to our society and to our individual personhood or dignity. I think that some reasonable amount of cost is reasonable to bear. And I think there's a clear opportunity with Congress. Again, Democrats and Republicans have, you know, decided that this is an important thing. But we've been trying to do something like this for a very long time. And it's not easy. That's why you haven't gotten to a data breach notification law. That's why you haven't gotten to kind of a consensus. And I, you know, to the extent that there could be some serious conversations about what to do. Again, with the hearings, it was kind of, you know, Every member wanted their opportunity to ask a question. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that generally. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when are we really going to have a serious conversation of what uh, what that legislation would look like, and how do you account for flexibility so that it doesn't you know it doesn't inhibit? Why is, why has that been hard? It doesn't see. I mean, it would seem like the companies that you work with and the you know would be the ones who would make it hard. So if you think you know, it's been this external forces, like who's blocking that kind of legislation? 
I think a lot of it is kind of, you know, the the education and understanding how technology is used. Like, you know, we there have been, you know, proposals on the Hill that you can't use GPS data. Well, I mean, that makes it impossible to use Uber. And so when you have conversations with policymakers, they're like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. But, you know, not being able to use GPS data for, you know, any number of apps on your phone makes them generally unusable. And so making sure that, you know, well, well intended that they understand the consequences and those conversations continue, but kind of, you know, we're moving, you know, the, the speed of technology is moving so fast that even the bills that were introduced, say, the beginning of this Congress were not necessarily account for kind of what's coming. Huh. I want to talk a little bit about what data is used for. Uh, I want to talk about algorithms, you know, understood kind of broadly here. Um, and, you know, one idea that I've heard a lot, you know, and I've just been kind of like out talking to people, you know, they're like, oh, you write about technology? Well, I have an idea about technology. Lots of people are like, well, why isn't there something like, like some agency out there that can actually audit the way that data is used, the uh, algorithms, you know, something like in between a National Institute of Standards and Technology and like an FDA, somebody who could sort of certify there aren't like discriminatory outcomes of this algorithm or yes, this self-driving car camera algorithm can pick up pedestrians. Um, it, do you see any need for that kind of agency or is that already something that can be dealt with in, in some other part of the, the government? Well, you've picked up such an important theme, which is the lack of real technological expertise in many parts of the government that, that seek to constrain or, or regulate. We have the Federal Trade Commission. It is actually a very good enforcement agency when it takes action. It's got limited resources. Somebody was pointing out on my team this morning, there are exactly 60 people working for the FTC for the entire United States of America to enforce privacy and data harm. Um, you've got NIST and other technical standards bodies. You have very little technological expertise in Congress, not only in the membership, but at staff level. We are encouraging and, and trying to help place technologists in those congressional offices at the Federal Trade Commission, at other agencies. But your point is so well taken that there's a disconnect. And I really want to point everyone to the thing that I think reveals the fact that there is a lack of technological expertise in a number of enforcement agencies. And that was the Volkswagen situation mm -hmm. of a year ago. I don't think that got enough attention. I know it got front page, you know, New York Times and Wall Street Journal and that sort of thing as a, as a systemic black swan risk for that company. But it really provided me the insight that state federal, local agencies that regulate technologies embedded in our daily lives, in our houses, in our cars, in our schools, do not know and cannot interrogate the algorithm and the technology and the devices themselves to find that kind of disparate impact, to find that inequity and inequality. We have a tool on our website because we're a nonprofit. We give it away for free. I really think we should monetize it candidly, <laughs> but that helps companies and really good companies have come to us and have said they're using it to, to question their very internal operations of their devices, of their decision making, but you've nailed it. It's not just the data, it's the decision that matters. And people are being discriminated against in ways we don't even entirely understand because we can't see inside the black box. Yeah. Well, and on a, on a safety level too, like around robotics is something I've been thinking a lot about because out in California, what came out during the regulatory proceedings around self-driving cars was that really there was no way for the, the DMV, the California DMV, to interrogate the way that these algorithms work because what were they going to do? These are incredibly complicated systems. They didn't have anybody on staff who had even remotely the kind of experience, let alone the time and all the resources to go do that kind of investigation to be like, are these cars safe to be on the road? Instead, we put them on the road and sort of hoped. Mm -hmm. No, I would, you know, if you look at self-driving vehicles, it's still kind of years out. And I think we will kind of innovate well, to the extent government can innovate toward how to address those issues. I don't think we're there yet. We're still a couple of years off. But I do think we can't, you know, miss the important opportunity of how many deaths it will reduce for self-driving vehicles. And so while we need to pay attention to these issues, let's not, uh, let's not move from a, you know, let's not operate from a space where uh, we're trying to prevent it. It's like how do we, how do we allow this innovation to help self save lives, but at the same time, making sure that there's, you know, there's a protocol or a process by which to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to know what more, we referenced it earlier, but I want to know a little more about what you think about California's data privacy law. As a Californian, 
we believe these things are going to go to the rest of the country, obviously, like everything else we do. And um, do you think, what, what do you think about it first? And do you think it's going to proceed across the country on a state by state basis, or uh, you'll get one piece of federal legislation? Well, I think it's an incredibly well intentioned piece of legislation. It's probably one of the best things I can say about it. Listen, I think at its core values. It's, it's not a very good thing to say about it, you know that. Listen, there's, there are lots of yeah. people complaining around the edges. I actually think it's a terrific moment for the United States, and it is data breach version two. Data breach version two, uh, the data breach laws started in California and with our friend Deirdre Mulligan, who is now at the Berkeley Ice Information School, where you are. Um, and it was a good example of beware the unintended consequences, because as Deirdre Mulligan, a CDT founder and former chair of our board said, we didn't think people were going to focus so much on the notice. We really thought they were going to focus on the remediation and the cleanup of the security of the systems internally. So they never had to, to provide all these notices that we are now all fatigued mm. about getting. But it is, it is true we don't have a federal data breach law. We have 50 state data breach laws now. And so companies, well, good companies, are trying to comply with all 50 at the same time. I would argue certainty for the companies and certainty for the consumers would be better to have one, one omnibus law, but we're not certainly going to weaken what is already there. Um, similarly, you've got California data law, and it is already spreading like wildfire. We have gotten calls from a dozen state legislators saying, how do I do that in my state? And so it, there will be differences, there will be disharmony, and I think that's why you also see companies come to the table. Listen, can I take a couple of questions? Yeah, so now I'll just add, I mean, I think an important thing to understand about California was the process. And so similar to Congress, you know, it's not good to legislate in times of crisis. And I think the opportunity, you know, the, the legislation was passed to prevent a ballot initiative. And it's not, you know, and I think even the, the, those who wrote it will, you know, admit that there are issues, there are concerns, they're going to have to go back, there are things they need to fix, there are definitional issues. And so, you know, I, I think it's important to kind of appreciate that that process wasn't one that was probably the most thoughtful and even the, the one the uh, legislators will admit that and so we have opportunities to kind of improve upon the law but again I think you know when we go forward particularly at the state or federal level that we need to you know kind of not be rushed kind of like appropriations or something because that may not necessarily create the best policy in the end. I thought the line around here was never waste a good crisis. Wasn't that the, oh, I, I like that. that. Sorry, I like yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Brogan Dinkst at the Chertoff Group. Uh, just a quick question on the Cloud Act, obviously one new piece of legislation from this year. Um, just curious about your viewpoints on it. Obviously it's sort of supported by both tech and government, but obviously it's a different perspective here. Um, on the changing juris jurisdictional issues around uh, data, where data is controlled, where it's housed, just your mm -hmm. perspective on it. I think CDT did not support the Cloud Act, although we worked very hard and very closely with a number of members who were supportive um, because we felt there weren't enough adequate human rights protections in that. But I, I do, of course, also understand the need for companies to respond to legitimate law enforcement. We want that those requests to be narrowly tailored, narrowly scoped, and with due process to the individual. So I don't think it's the last we're going to see of that issue globally, right? As, as data moves... Uh, faster and, and more globally than ever, and it is less clear to the individual where their data rights extend to and where their data literally and figuratively is. So I have this phrase I, I use at work, which is the digital self, that I have rights in my data no matter where it is. I give, I'm giving my voice to you right now freely. You can, you're going to quote me or not or whatever. Um, but I have ongoing rights in my identity and in my, my work product, my communications online. The Supreme Court in the United States has upheld that in almost every tech case, and CDT has been an amicus in almost every tech case in the last decade. So the Supreme Court matters, and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, that is all the time we have. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you.